What up, Hope Biscuits? It's your girl Skitten back at it again. Here with my husband. Hello, husband. What's up? So, two weeks ago, I was casually scrolling through my comments, as one does when they are slightly obsessive about their comments on the YouTube channel. And I saw something very exciting. Guess what it is? You're getting a new dog. Why would that be the comment? You just said yes, and it's just a wide open field. You gotta who, funnel me. Who is getting me the, okay, just think through this with me. Okay. Like, who would be getting me the dog? I don't know. My brain's a basin. You need to add a funnel. You understand what I'm saying? It's a lot of <laughs> wide open water here. Where are we going? Extra History commented on our History of Beer video. Oh, that's fantastic. And they said that they hope we get to finish the series, which I felt like was a very pointed remark towards my husband. <laughs> I want to see it. Pull it up. Put it'll it back be, here. It'll be back there. Thanks for commenting. You know, no shade necessary. I was going to finish it. I how, promise. How long has it been since the last one, my love? It doesn't matter. It's about the journey. So we are finally here for part three of the History of Beer series by Extra History. That, it literally, it made my day when I Actually, read that comment. this is really cool, but also just so you guys know, Extra History, we've been quoting facts from your videos to people. Oh yeah. Ever since we started watching. Oh yeah. It's been super fun. All the time. And people yeah. are like, really? I didn't know that. We're like, <laughs> I'm sure you I'm did. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> Anyway, very excited to see what this video has in store for us. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are staying safe and sanitized. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Germany, 1539. The table at Martin Luther's home seats 50 people, and nearly every seat is full. He's in fine form tonight. He calls the Pope the Antichrist, refers to the church as a brothel, oh and discourses God. about the noxious farts previous popes have let off. Real rebellious talk. <laughs> yeah. As he speaks, his wife, Katharina, a former nun, fills his stein. That's cool. A former nun? Yeah, that's cool. He's really that boy. She said, I am wedded to God. And Martin Luther said, or mm -hmm. you could be wedded to me. And she That's was all like, a farce, by the way, baby. Let me talk to you. She was like, you're right. I will be wedded to you instead of to God. Right. Martin Luther is literally that guy your parents warn you about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stray from the teachings of God. As he speaks, his wife, Katharina, a former nun, fills his stein. She makes the beer herself, thousands of liters a year, cool. in the Luther's personal brewery. Wow. And it's good, lubricating these table sessions. Plus, <laughs> the beer is hopped, itself an act of rebellion, as hops currently are an untaxed weed, different oh. from the spice mix the Catholic monks use in their brewing. As wow. Luther continues, one listener takes notes and will publish these remarks in a book called Table Talk. Others will create beer steins showing That's the Pope cool. as the Antichrist. It would seem that Catholicism's monopoly and brewing is falling apart over Katharina's fine beer. Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for helping us brew up today's historical tale. When we left off, alehouses, taverns, and inns had come on the scene. And just as important, people had started hopping ale a method that properly turned the beverage into beer. Okay, so an ale yeah. is no hops, mm -hmm. and a beer is with hops. Got it. Okay. Weed. What? Hops a weed. Yeah. Yeah. You said weed, and I was like, marijuana? Right. And I was like, no, babe. That's what I was saying. I was like, no, babe, they didn't. <laughs> I know, that's, yeah, that's exactly what went through my head, too. Creating a more complex tasting product that could be made in larger batches without spoiling, shipped, and to a certain extent, even branded. Indeed, ah. hops was the first true step in turning beer into a viable commercial product. And as the 14th and 15th centuries wound on, certain breweries started becoming famous for their beer. One major center of brewing was Munich, Munich. where the Augustina Brewery, run initially by Augustinian monks, formed in 1328. Okay. Soon, they were experimenting with a new type of strong beer known as Bach. Much as France Bach. was already famous in the medieval era for its wine, Munich became known for its quality beer a reputation they tried to protect by passing a beer purity law in 1560, <laughs> declaring cool. that the only ingredients in beer could be water, barley, and hops, okay. this being considered part of the production rather than an ingredient. While this was not the first beer quality law in the Holy Roman Empire, nor did it apply outside of Bavaria, right. it was a masterful exercise in branding, yeah, declaring cool. to the European market that Munich cared about its beer. Not everyone, though, was so excited about hops. And I think that's really interesting because when you look at, like, France and 
how they do their wine and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, people always, like, make fun of people who are like, it's not champagne unless it comes from the champagne region of France. But that's, li like, yeah. you literally cannot call your wine champagne. Right. If it's not from the champagne. And same thing with, like, a burgundy. Mm -hmm. It cannot be called a, I think, I'm pretty sure it cannot be called a burgundy unless it comes from the burgundy region of France. Okay. Like, that branding is just so important to establishing established dominance but like establishing yourself in an industry but well, don't we have the same thing here with like brandy or something like that um i think maybe whis whiskey or bourbon bourbon bourbon, bourbon. it cannot be bourbon Bass unless it comes from kentucky right yeah. so you know that's a that's one of those established traditions that i think work long term yeah. english in particular considered hopped beer repulsive and unhealthy why and for foreigners while unhopped top for yeah, yeah. ale was best for them oh, okay. even shakespeare weighed in having his heroes drink ale, not beer. Oh. And no wonder, for his father was an official ale taster. Got it. But beer was becoming more common in England. By 1574, 36% of London brewers had switched to hopped beer, wow. leading to a competition between the two drinks. Unable to compete on longevity so or its array of flavors, English ale brewers began tinkering to increase the amount of alcohol. <laughs> London's beer brewers retaliated until England was awash in high-proof mixes given hyperbolic names like Dragon's Milk, and English beer became thus known as both powerful and coming in a huge variety of flavors. Got it. In fact, the English market was huge, with a large number of independent brewers. This was partially because when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, their brewing operations got turned over to laymen, creating wow. a thriving professional industry wow. large and respectable enough to form guilds. That was not expected. I was going to say, that's the part of, you know, Tudor history you don't ever hear about. No. I you don't hear about. You hear about divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived, right? You hear about, you know, Mary, Bloody Mary, and Queen Elizabeth I. You don't hear about how dis the dissolution yeah. of the church led to an increase and and diversification of beer production. But see, it's funny because it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Because you do hear about the, the, you know, the lessening role of religion in, in that, in like, high society. Yeah. So then where would it have to go? Yeah. It's got to go somewhere. That makes a lot of Regular sense. Regular people would start doing it. But not everyone was happy about that. For something like seven millennia, Brewsters, female brewers, weren't just at the center of beer manufacturing. They were running they it. They were beer yeah. manufacturing. And provided they only sold to neighbors, it stayed that way. But when beer became a fully-fledged industry, women could no longer participate. That's bullshit. To do that, they would have to hire and manage a staff, participate in guilds, travel away from the home to ship goods, and represent the brewery and sign contracts. All things women at the time were barred from doing. <laughs> Built off our backs. Every time you call beer a man's drink, just know. Still, a few did. Largely <laughs> widows who showed up at guild meetings on behalf of their family until children came of age, yet that became less common over time. Got it. Women were still part of the cycle, but now they were the ones serving the beer, Annoying. not making it. Meanwhile, another group was starting to worry about the effects of all this brewing. The leaders and state. Mm -hmm. At first, their concerns were centered around taverns. In 1400, when Chaucer set his Canterbury Tales in a tavern, a space where a knight could rub shoulders with a miller, nuns, a pardoner, and a wife of Bath, he <laughs> was reflecting the reality of his time. Right. Taverns were a secular space where, by tradition, class distinctions were set aside and people could speak freely. This not only made it a congregating space to rival that of churches, and clerics often complained of people being on a bench in a tavern rather than on their knees in a chapel, it also was a political center. One that could be used to criticize the crown or engage in sedition, especially because, with enough beer, things just kind of slip out. Like Martin <laughs> Luther at his table, or the gunpowder plot, hatched in a series of the London taverns. Yeah. So yeah, they weren't really off the mark on that sedition thing. What's the gunpowder plot? Um, I'm pretty sure it's when somebody tried to blow up uh, the House of Lords. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty, I've I'm heard pretty of that. Sure. Yeah, I've heard of I'm that. I'm not well versed in and my that, English slash British history. And that happened in a tavern. They were just kind of hanging out, be like, you know what? Let's blow some shit up. Dog. How's that sound? <laughs> Give me some more of that beer, not ale, first of all. I'm dead. Dragon's breath will blow a hole in that shit. But there wasn't really much they could do. Beer was a staple of life, and by Elizabeth's time, London had a public house for every 125 residents. Wow. Meaning this yeah. booty genie was well out of the bottle. Yeah. Leaders also increasingly worried about drunkenness, a social ill that became more concerning as European society professionalized and became more advanced. See, here's the thing about medieval peasants. They didn't do a lot, like they had to plant one season, harvest another, keep animals, and get to church. 
And that was kind of it. They even had a lot of religious holidays, meaning that if some were drunk here and there, it wasn't that big an issue. Mm. But then society started developing more specialist artisan yeah, traits, yeah. Yeah. With business so. dealings, where they had to fulfill contracts and be places on time. Meaning being drunk became a bit more detrimental. <laughs> Some of the first concerns around problem drinking centered around young students at 13th century universities who were infamous for imbibing mass quantities of wine and terrorizing the residents of the town. <laughs> what? And it looks like things haven't changed. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> man, history really just repeats itself, huh? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like, it reminds me of the, uh, the Four Loco era. You know, yeah. when Four Locos first came out, before that changed the ingredients, people were just oh showing up God. to school drunk. Putting them in a, what, what my friends used to put, I was homeschooled, but I did mm -hmm. have friends in public school, mm -hmm. and they used to talk about putting them in Gatorade bottles because they were the same color. Yeah. So they actually banned Gatorade in class. <laughs> And nobody could figure out really why until you're like, oh, because you guys are drinking vodka and mixed drinks in school. They're drinking malt liquor <laughs> in the cafeteria. In both ox. Oh, God. Two years? Yep. Yep. He said, my, uh, uh, uh. That's a hilarious thing. I was getting ready to ask why he was pooping while you were saying Ew! <laughs> I was like, why did they draw him on the toilet? He said, look, man, when you got a little backed up, oh you know God. what I'm saying? Get your tanker, take a seat, chillin'. Beer had become an institution. A substance so important to European life, finance, and culture, it could not be acted against. So, it was informally agreed upon that instead of banning the substance itself, civil and church leaders would essentially tell people not to go overboard. Instead, more scorn was heaped on the newly created distilled spirits discovered by alchemists. Originally sold in single-shot glasses as medicine, they were increasingly being drunk for pleasure. There was, however, an outlier. One Anabaptist reformer dared to call on fellow Christians to abstain from even beer and wine. Okay. Drinking, he argued, inevitably led to sin. His fellow Protestants promptly beheaded him. Oh, but the 16th and 17th God. centuries were not only the era of reformation, they were also the era of exploration. See, look, people think that, that they stand by their convictions, yeah. that they, you know, they have morals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would you be willing to behead somebody? That's generally part Chop of the group. off their head for you. his dissenting opinion? No, you wouldn't. You are not half as principled as you think you are. They, they, they say you ain't built like that for real. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm built different than my ancestors. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Yo, you're out the, here filming people. You're going the right direction. You're out here filming people. You know what they did? They took those students and they, they hung, hung them. them. They were like the carroting. We're getting rid of carrots. But are you guys bringing back lynching of carrots? Oh my god! No, no, no not not lynchings. Think 16th century beheadings. Oh That's what we're god. talking about. God, god, dog. Three, two, one, five. As the Spanish conquered Central and South America, and the Portuguese went to Asia, they Tequila. also discovered new worlds of alcohol. Tequila. Da, da, In Peru, da, 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 they found da, da, da. the Incas making maize beer. The Aztecs, meanwhile, fermented agave sap into a cloudy beer-like concoction which once distilled with European technology, became mezcal and tequila. In China and Japan, sailors encountered fine rice wine. Wherever Sucker. they went, they found drinks made from fruit, tree bark, and palm sap. 
But when the English landed in North America, they contacted a people who, while they fermented alcohol out of mesquite pods and maple sap depending on their region, had not encountered stronger grain-based alcohols. Yeah. The settlers decided to change that. Wow. So join us next time as we enter the Age of Revolution, where American rebels plot in taverns, nice. Catherine the Great swigs Russian Imperial Stout, and yep. a long sea voyage puts the India into pale ale. Okay! That's this good. was fun. This was a fun one. I really yeah. enjoyed it. So, husband, now that you know more about the history of beer, mm -hmm. does it make it like taste better to you when you drink it? It actually makes me think about every time I drink it, because some beers have like a really strong taste. Yeah. And then I go, I want to sample more beers. Yeah. You know? And it's weird thinking about the fact when I drink some of these beers, I'm like they're never going to have a Tommy's Grog. No. You know? They're never gonna taste the what's the Pacific what was the other one? Pacific Ocean or whatever one I have. Yeah. You know, that's what I think about. And they the don't have any uh what is it? Kona or Kona. Blue Wave or Yeah, whatever. no blue wave. They no don't have shock top. No pineapple carts. You know? And it also does make me think about how like we enjoy things kind of the same way people have always enjoyed things. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's pretty cool. It does make it very I have grounded. learned that I don't like beers with a lot of hops. So maybe I like ales, mm. or maybe I don't like ales and I like beers with hops. It's one of the two. It's one of the two. Yeah, yeah. it's the jelly jam <laughs> but, argument. But really, beer. realistically, I mm. don't enjoy drinking beer unless it's in the form of a michelada. I was going to say, you drink micheladas all the time. Because they taste like tomato juice. It tastes like tomato juice and whatever spices you put in it, and it tastes like chamoy, and it tastes like tamarindo. Like, that's what it tastes like. Right, but not V8. No, it's not giving V8. <laughs> right. Unless you get a bad michelada. Bad michelada okay. taste like V8. So Anyways. next episode, we're going to be with Native Americans, the colonizers of the United States. And Catherine the Great. And beer. Okay. Very excited. You know, last time we promised you it wasn't going to take a month to get to this reaction. And it didn't. It took two. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to make any promises as to the timeline of the next one, but we will for sure react to it. Thank you again so much to Extra History for taking the time to watch and comment on the previous video. And thank you guys again for watching and interacting. And other than that, peace out, Hope Biscuits. It's skittin' lit.